What I love to do is introduce the right people to the right people, assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation, and that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. Okay, guys, Jay Martin here, CEO of Cambridge House, and I'm joined right now by Jamie Keach, the founder of Resource Insider and a partner at Inventa Capital. Jamie, it's good to see you. Jay, thanks for having me back on. I was thinking it's been a little while. I think it's the better part of a year, so I'm excited to be here. Yes. Well, I want to pick your brain. I've got a handful of uh, topics I want to jump into today. Determine where you're looking for opportunity, where you place capital, what you think is overpriced, get into your investment philosophy, a whole ton of stuff. So why don't we start with uh, the macro environment a little bit? You know, 2020 finished so hot, um, you know, especially last spring, right? About a year ago, right? 2021 was very sleepy until relatively recently and now we've seen gold begin to rally a little bit and a number of things start to fire on the macro front so what's catching your eye right now jamie what are you what are you watching right now that you think investors should be paying attention to in terms of the macro front i mean the number one thing that we're paying attention to which i think you know everyone's talking about it's not it's not new it's not novel but what's going on with inflation and the fact that inflation is being considered a reality um, for the first time in, in decades. And no doubt you've had other guests on here talking about this, but you know, it's nowhere more apparent than things like lumber prices, which are up three, four, or five times, depending on, on where you're living. Uh, you know, the my analyst that works for me, for example, his mother is building a house in Pittsburgh. And the quote she got went up 20% in six weeks. Uh, for the co- and they're actually replacing lumber with steel beams in part of this house, and so that's a little bit antidotal, but it, it shows you what's going what going on and, and how fast that's actually happening. So obviously, the impact of inflation is something we're we're really paying attention to right now, and you know we've seen that massively reflected across the commodities basket, and we're starting starting to see that reflected in gold. I think for the first time. Uh, so far. Yeah, I think you're right. And you know what I've shared on this channel, a very similar example to what you just shared. Um, I'm building a shed behind my house right now. And I was going to build it last summer. And the lumber, the boards that I wanted from Home Depot were about like $32 per board. And they're mm-hmm. 76 this year, right? One year later. And so, you know, we, we touched that number. It's very real. We feel inflation immediately. But the number one debate on my channel last year, Jamie, was the inflationist versus the deflationist. And have you put any thought into that? Or is it, is it, for, first, let me hit you with that first. Do you, do you put any weight on the deflation argument? Well, what is the case for the deflation ar- argument? Because I don't actually see that. I see, I see inflation having been a pretty real thing for a long time now, right? Because <clears> we've seen everything that can't be easily exported has inflated massively over the last 20 years. Living here in Vancouver, obviously housing prices being the number one thing we notice. If you're in the United States, you see healthcare. If you're in the United States, you see education in a big way. All these things that we can't easily export overseas are inflating. But now for the first time, and I think in a large part because of COVID, we're seeing this start to trickle down to consumer goods, Mm -hmm. right? So I, I don't see a strong case for deflation, but I'd I'd be curious to hear that argument. Well, yeah, and the more I dive into it with my deflationary guests, I'd call them, is that it's not necessarily a this versus that argument as much as I believe it's a this then that argument. And the deflationary arguments are largely driven by um, the exponential growth of technology. You know, albeit deflation hits us in more subtle ways, right? The price of lumber hits my wallet. I feel that impact. I believe in inflation because it's immediate, right? And it hurts. Whereas, you know, I think about the price I pay for things like music compared to what I paid for music 10 years ago, 20 bucks for a CD versus $7 a month for more than I could ever consume today. And that's, that's the slow creep of deflationary technology right? Eating that part of my life. I think the deflationist argument when it gets into bigger consumer goods like lumber, and this is more conceptual and speculative, is once Home Depot can print my boards out of composite just down the road, and we're not worried about supply chains and logistics, that's when it hits goods like that as well. That's my understanding anyways. Yeah. I mean, I think that makes sense, but I think that's, it's kind of irrelevant in the grander scheme of things, right? I mean, 
the twenty dollars CD is nice to have, or rather, the seven dollars sort of Spotify membership is nice to have versus the twenty dollars CD. But I think we're going to actually see real inflation in the things that actually matter for our lives, things like construction materials, things like food. You know, another friend of mine, his father owns a grocery store, and they're upping all their prices right now. And so I don't really see、uh, technology massively changing the price of food. In the in the near term future, right? And obviously, there's all sorts of efficiencies that can be created in farming and supply chains and stuff like that. But if anything, one COVID has taken a huge, huge hit out of like the efficiency of supply chains in the world. And I guess you can make the case that in a post COVID world, you know, there's going to be a flood of capital coming in. Everything's going to go back to normal. Supply chains are going to open up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera.、Um, You know, inflation might not be such an issue, but I actually don't see that happening. I think the next real step that we're going to be seeing is, you know, increased resource nationalism. I think we're going to see countries turn inward.、Uh, you know, I'm not the first person to speak about this, but I think the era of globalization is kind of in decline, and the era of nationalization is starting. And countries are going to start. Prioritizing investment and control of their own asset. You know, we've own assets and their own commodities, and we've seen that in the U.S.、Uh, already with things like uranium. We've seen we're seeing that heavily in places like Chile, even right now,、uh, historically in lithium. So I think this is going to be a bigger and bigger trend, and I think inflation is going to be a real problem in the things that matter. And by matter, I mean the things that we need and the things that are actually expensive. Okay, so I agree with you on both those two points. Dialing it back to inflation, and then I want to get into resource nationalization because that's very important. We'll talk about that when it comes to the inflation play, Jamie. How does that impact your investment philosophy and how you're allocating capital? So, Resource Insider, you know, it was birthed really on an inflation play. The things we're talking about now are things we've been talking about for three years. So my、uh, my partner at Resource Insider, a gentleman named named Chris McIntosh, the founder of Capitalist Exploits. Capitalist Exploits is a blog、uh, and an investment firm focused solely on macro investing. And Chris was very very. Uh, had very strong has and had very strong opinions on these things for the last several years. He saw a lot of what was coming,、uh, you know, probably four or five years ago, and he knew that he wanted to be focused on commodities. He wanted to be focused on real hard assets to counteract against inflation, to counteract against global debt, to counteract against national resource nationalism.、Um, but he didn't know how to execute on it. You know he's not he's not a mining person he's not an energy person he needed someone、uh, who could actually go out and do deals acquire assets get things done and so we partnered where my job was to execute and his job was the macro theme so I've learned a tremendous amount from him on macroeconomics he's been consistently right even when I was sure he was going to be wrong and I've started to I've started to buy in and really drink the Kool Aid but my job in my investment thesis or how I'm executing the investment thesis is. What do we go after, and how do we go after it to really、um, execute on this idea and protect our wealth, and actually put it in a position where we can grow it、uh, in a in what I think is going to become a really challenging environment for the world. And you know, Jay, you know, and some of your listeners will know, at Resource Insider, we're focused on the mining space primarily, and what we do is private placements and deals in the sector. So I go out and I talk to companies across the sector, across the commodities. Uh, and I look for good investment opportunities. I put my own money in, and our members get to invest alongside us. So, where we've focused、uh, over the last three years that we've been doing this, we've done it in uranium. So, we we've built a big portfolio of uranium stocks, which is up about 180 percent right now. We've got lots of assets、uh, that are gold, lots of gold assets, and then of course we've got copper. We're working on nickel. We've got some lithium. Uh, but we're really, really trying to build a diverse sort of metals and mining portfolio. Okay, so let's zero in on copper for a little bit because I would like that to be the focus for today.、Uh, we've got a ton of inquiries from my audience asking questions like, "What's different about investing in copper、uh, from investing in gold?" Right, and I gravitate towards things like, "Well, the exit strategy for one." Right, if you're a gold. Developer, you've got an economic asset. You've got a number of exit strategies. Hundreds、mm. of suitors that might be looking for an acquisition. You could raise the capital and build the mine yourself. 
that does not apply in the copper space. But what advice would you have, Jamie, for a retail investor who's got a few years under their belt speculating in the gold space, and now they're trying to allocate capital to the copper sector? So I would say the number one thing you should be aware of, and anyone who's spent any time looking at this is probably already aware of, is that there's way, way fewer options in the copper space available to you as an investor. So if, if we look at the TSXV, where you see most of these junior companies listed, it's something like, and I'm not going to get these numbers exactly right, right, but it's something like 70% of all mining companies on there are junior. Or what am I trying to say? 70% of all junior mining companies on there are gold. Yeah. And then like the next 20% are copper. And then the last 10% is like pretty much everything else, be it iron ore, be it nickel, be it lithium, whatever. So copper is, you know, a fraction of the size of gold. So there's less names in there that are available to choose from. In some ways, you know, in some ways that's a good thing because there's less shitty names in there. And, you know, gold seems to me to have this particular ability to attract the uh, hucksters that copper doesn't quite have. And sure. I think a big part of the reason for that is copper doesn't have quite the sex appeal to the average person as gold. And it, you know, it, it, it tends to be, I think, and I think you were alluding to this, it's more for the serious mining people and it's more for the serious mining companies. So, you know, to your point, if we, if we can elaborate on that, the exit strategies are different. Well, the reason the exit strategies are different is because copper exploration and copper mining tends to be way, way, way more expensive, way more capital intensive than a gold mining project, right? So to put a copper mine into production, it's not unusual to see two, three plus billion dollar market caps, where often you can put gold mines into production for sub a hundred million dollars. Now, if I have a $100 million exploration company, it's not that hard for me to raise an extra $100 million to put it into production. If I've got a $100 million copper exploration company, the idea of bringing in $3 billion of financing is it's unforeseeable. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. It would destroy the company. So your only option is to sell it to a major. So there's if you look around, uh, there's there's very, very few copper mid-tier miners, right? I can think of Eros Copper as a good example in Brazil. Uh, you might have been able to call Turquoise uh, Turquoise Hill in Mongolia, Robert Friedman's deal. That, But I mean that the operator now is Rio Tinto. It's yeah. a $4 billion company. But these are sort of the, the, the startup stages of copper assets right now. Whereas you can you can you can really get a wide basket of, of gold uh, mid tier and small scale mine or small single asset miners. So your you know your playing field is really really different. Uh, the good news is you know the winners quite clearly stand out, um, but the early stage stuff, the exploration, I would say you're actually taking on you know a much more significant level of risk there because <laughs> one you have to make a discovery. And two, even if you make a discovery, which is, you know, far from certain, it has to be a discovery that the company can advance. You know, it's possible to make a discovery that is so far out of the depth of what a company that size can do with that it hurts the share structure, it limits the access to capital, it puts them in a position where they're not able to bring the project forward. And it, it, it's reflected in the value for shareholders. So therefore, what do you need to see? Do you need to see... Uh a period of work done, you know, years invested before you'll get involved, Jamie, with your wallet. What do you need to see before you'll take a company seriously? Well, uh, let me tell you uh, in a couple of stories of what we have done. So I think the very first thing uh, investors want to be thinking about is like, what is the value add catalyst that they're investing for? So looking at copper deals, we just invested in a massive, massive copper project in Latin America. Uh, it's a private deal right now. I can't even say the name of it. We just finished the investment this week. But, you know, we're investing alongside three of the biggest mining companies in the world, the biggest mining private equity fund in the world, big New York hedge fund. Uh, you know, there's, they've got 15, 20 million bucks in the bank. But it's in an area that has historically been hard to permit. And for reasons I won't get into right now, I believe they're going to get their permits. I, can, I believe they're going to be drilling soon. And I believe when they drill, they're going to be a listed company. So the reason that I'm investing here is because I want to see them permitted. 
I want to see them drilling, and I want to see them listed. That will be a huge value creation catalyst for investors that got in before those things happened. And I anticipate seeing this company listed uh, and going next year. I anticipate that we're going to make three or four X the money we put in at that point. Now, will they make a discovery there? I don't know. You know, it remains to be seen. If they make a discovery, will there be a mine there? I don't know. Remains to be seen. If they find a mine, will they be able to permit it and put it into production? I don't know. It remains to be seen. But none of those things actually matter for me. I'm investing because I believe politically the time is ripe for them to get permitted. I believe they're going to get drilling. I believe they're going to list. And that's going to create value for me. So I think it's very important that um, investors kind of know why they're investing. Don't invest in a deal like this because you want to see a producing copper mine. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Another example of a company we've invested in is Meridian Mining. They are public. We invested in them at 20 cents. And this is, okay, this is the perfect, perfect copper deal. Because when we looked at this company, um, I'm going to blank on what the market cap was at that point. I want to say it was like $20 million, but I don't think that's exactly right. It was 20 cents uh, what they were trading at. A small junior company had acquired a project that had had the shit drilled out of it by Rio Tinto, okay? And they'd had something like $100 million of drilling and infrastructure and work put into this deal. And we were able to invest in it for something like $20 million. So when I look at that, I'm like, well, you're inheriting $100 million of work pretty much for free. Uh, you know, the exploration and capital costs associated with that are going to be far, far decreased um, to what it would be if it was a grassroots program. Additionally, they have tons and tons and tons and tons of data. So what they're doing now is confirmatory drilling. So they're going in and they're sinking, you know, one hole for every 10 holes that already exist. And they're saying, yeah, you know, the data matches. This is correct. We can assume this is right. Mm -hmm. On to the next. And they're able to very quickly, very cost effectively build out a resource. So what I'm investing for here is a quick, cheap, easy resource that they're going to say, look at there is copper here. There's this much copper here. There, hopefully there's more than we thought. And it's going to see a re-rating of the value of that company. You know, we thought there was this much copper. Turns out there's that much copper. It's worth a lot more. You know, since we've invested, you know, they hit like 80 cents this week. So we're up, you know, quite a bit on this. We had a full warrant or maybe a half warrant on this one. So it's been a tremendous return for me and for members of Resource Insider since uh, I want to say it was early December last year that we came into this. And these are the sort of the unique opportunities in the copper space that I look for. So that's that's the deal side. That's going out with Resource Insider, finding these deals. If I'm a, a normal, non-obsessive, compulsive mining investor, and I'm sitting at home and I think I'm looking for copper exposure, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a very different tact than this. I'm gonna say, well, I should probably own Freeport, Freeport McNamara. It's you know, probably the biggest copper miner in the world. They've got operations all over the world. If I'm just looking for leverage to copper price, hard to do better than that. Okay. I'm going to probably also buy a Turquoise Hill, right? Uh, you know, one of the big, best copper mines in the world, operating in uh, Mongolia, discovered by Robert Friedman, one of the best explorers uh, in history, operated by Rio Tinto, one of the best operators in history, $4 billion market cap, single asset. It's going to get taken out by Rio Tinto at some point. That's the obvious sort of future of this thing. So that's a single tier one. And then you know, I'd probably buy Nova Royalty, right? It's the only copper royalty company I've ever seen, or at least that I know about. Uh, they don't have any producing streams or royalties at this point. Uh, they're probably a little expensive, but royalty companies tend to trade at a premium. They're doing great work there. That would be my kind of riskier bet if I were just, you know, if I'm a dentist sitting at home in Missouri and I think I want copper exposure, that's kind of how, how I would play it. And then honestly, I would listen to me talking right now and I would probably go buy Meridian Mining because I think that thing's going to be a lot bigger. I think it's going to be a multi-dollar stock over the coming years. I would take those, you know, share certificates. I would sort of stick them under my mattress and I would just like forget about it for a couple of years and come back because I think all these things are going to be in a much, much better position. I think we're, I truly think we're in for like a generational copper market on this one. 
I love it, man. Okay, so thank you for that. And uh, a couple names never hurts. Uh, myself, my audience love that. So I should say this is not investment advice, I guess, or something yeah, like that. This thing on my channel. But this is what I would do in, in that in that no that's, uh, situation. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, appreciate the clarity. Um, and all I do here is talk about what I'm doing, what I'm looking at. Uh, and exactly, I don't recommend anybody follows me down any of these rabbit holes. But uh, I appreciate your your insight, Jamie. So. Um, looking at the U S right now, any companies stand out that you think or you're curious about, you think investors should take a look at, you think have asymmetric upside promise. So looking at the U S any jurisdictions in the U S yeah. Copper companies. Correct. I don't know. I don't own any U S copper companies to be honest. Okay. Okay. And I don't have any, so I own, I'll tell you, I own Meridian mining. Uh, that's in Brazil. Awesome. I own Solaris uh, Resources. That's in Ecuador. Also going awesome. Uh, you know, I, you know, and this is, this just goes to the exponential return potential of these mining stocks. You know, I bought Solaris Copper at 50 cents, 50 cents. It's at $11 right now. Okay. And where else do you see these returns? You know, I kind of like laugh at Bitcoin when people are like, oh, Bitcoin went up 10, 10x in one year. Like that's a 12x and that's just one deal. And you get these opportunities in mining and you get them, you know, so few other places in the world, maybe tech investing. But in mining investing, these deals list on public exchanges. You know, you're not locked up for the next 10 years. I can sell any of these stocks right now. It's, it's, it's an amazing opportunity. Uh, and then I'm also in... Um, Surge, Surge Copper, which is a BC focused exploration company. They've got a resource. Uh, they're searching. They're searching porphyry projects. Uh, they're right next to uh, a historic copper mine. Um, you know, I think British Columbia is going to be like the Chile of the future in terms of copper production. Interesting. Okay, and we we hope in the good sense of discovery, not in the recent, <laughs> not in the recent sense of a hard lean left and a nationalization of assets. Why I think that is now historically, BC porphyry coppers are considered uh, relatively low grade, and they are low grade with respect to what we were finding in Chile sure. historically. But you know, the whole narrative in the world right now is this push towards ESG, right? Uh, environmental, social, governance, doing things in a green way, doing things that reduce carbon footprint, right? Now, companies, I think we're seeing, we're seeing the most progressive companies like Apple, for example, have very stringent guidelines on their supply chain management. Where does their cobalt come from? Was it, you know, mined by uh, child miners uh, in the Congo? That's obviously not something they want, but I think this is going to be something we see more of that the supply chain becomes very, very important. And when you look at British Columbia, first and foremost, something like 95% of all power produced here is hydroelectric power, right? It's the cleanest energy in the world. So mm -hmm. how do most of these copper projects around the world that are getting mined uh, by burning oil and gas, by burning coal, compete with the you know, green and cleanliness of British Columbia copper? Secondly, you know, we're meeting, uh, you know, the highest international environmental standards, social standards, uh, engaging with indigenous people in respectful, responsible, sustainable ways. So I think BC, you know, it's got a plethora of copper deposits here, and we're just about to enter like the golden age of, of mining and exploring these things. I'm with you. Yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, to your point about resource nationalization, I, that's why I asked with the U S you know, I, I just feel like any national supply of any commodity is going to be a priority. Yeah. And, um, but I think Canada and the U S are going to be very linked on that. You know, I, the U S is the manufacturing hub and Canada really is the supply hub of those materials. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, somewhat of a leading question because I'm also chatting with Rick Trotman, a CEO that I follow, uh, Barstow. <laughs> oh yeah, I own that deal too. <laughs> I forgot. So I do own one U.S. copper deal. Oh, yeah, Rick, I'm sorry. I'm sorry because I am excited about everything they're doing there now. Yeah. Okay. So this is Barstow in Arizona. Recently consolidated that district. Interesting. Okay. Oh, you are a shareholder. Interesting. Okay. So I am a shareholder. All Resource Insider members are a shareholder too. Or not all Resource Insider members. All Resource Insider members had the opportunity to become shareholders. You know, we, we, it's just, it's such a cool project because we invested in that at 38 cents with a half warrant. It's the cheapest financing they'd ever done. They'd been at this thing 
for years, right? They were holding, they're basically holding on, waiting for permits to properly drill these projects. And they believe this yeah. is the extension of the Taylor deposit, which is part of Arizona mining, which got bought by South 32 for, I don't remember how many billions of dollars, but a lot of them. Uh, and so the idea is if they ever get drills turning on this thing, you know, from the from the geological evidence we have so far, it's very indicative that that deposit carries over onto Barksdale's property. It can be much, much bigger. It could be worth, you know, exponentially more than what it is right now. So we invested in it uh, in a bit of a doldrum time. It's done tremendously well since then. You know, they just had news, uh, I believe it was early this week or last week, that they executed upon their option. They now own 100% of the project. Originally, I think they were on track to own 66%. So it's way, way more valuable. And the market hasn't barely like woken up to that fact yet. And this is the kind of project where whether it's in a it's going to be probably this year, knock on wood, when they sink a drill hole in that damn thing and they prove that thing extends like, you know, this has 10 X return potential written all over it. I love it. Okay. Okay. Jamie, look, it's been great having you on. I love your energy, man. And, uh, and you talk your book, which I appreciate you tell us exactly where you've put capital, um, yeah. where you've got skin in the game, which I, I appreciate my audience appreciates. So thanks for making the time. Well, you know, I, I think that's important to do because the reason we do it uh, is because Resource Insider, it's, it's private deals when we do it or they're, 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 they're pipe deals. But we want to tell people, you know, what we've been doing uh, after it's done because we don't sell a stock picking newsletter. I'm not hoarding information. We, we put our own money into deals that we think are going places and we tend to hold stock for significant periods of time. And so, I mean, anyone on your, of your audience, if they want to see our entire portfolio, they can send me an email at jamie at resourceinsider.com and I will show them every trade we've ever made from inception for in the entire you know, history of our newsletter. And I don't think we have any competitors that would do something like that because you know, we're up uh, 160 something percent right now. I'll show you the good, the bad and the ugly, everything we've ever done. So yeah, please send me an email. Love it, man. Okay, appreciate that. Thanks again, Jamie. All right. Thanks for having me on.